Thanks everyone for tuning in today, whether you're on video conference or live here at Crittenden Campus. A couple of logistics before we get started. Uh, my name is Rachel O'Mara and I'm a wellness champion for the Optimize Your Life series. I work out of San Francisco, but as part of the Optimize Your Life series, uh, this is a global initiative that helps to keep all Googlers healthy, whether it's uh, health, uh, mental or uh, physical types of health. So we're really excited to have Mark Thornton here today to talk. Uh, there will also be time at the end for questions. So for anyone who has a question in the audience, you can use the mic that will be in the center aisle. Or if you're on video conference, if you can wait till the end, that would be great. And uh, we'll take your question that Mark will repeat. So uh, a couple things to talk about just before I hand the microphone over to Mark. Uh, there is a couple things to be aware of as this is one of the talks of the health series. You can find out a lot about what's happening for future talks at go slash O-Y-L. And they also have a Google Plus page you can follow. Uh, there's also uh, anyone who's interested can also sign up to be a fellow wellness champion and all that means is you're an advocate to help bring people in to speak that uh, you feel would be worthy to come in and share their, their insights. And you can sign up at go slash go to slash wellness champions. So first, a bit about Mark, a uh, couple, couple points I want to highlight. And I have to admit, this is not how I would have introduced him when I met him at Burning Man last year, but I think uh, it's worth it. It's worth plugging. So Mark is the former chief operating officer at JP Morgan Private Bank. And he's also the best-selling author of Meditation in a New York Minute. We do have some copies of that available here uh, for purchase for $5. We do have a limited supply, so if we run out, they're taking names for uh, future purchases that I think we'll get the books in about two weeks, and that's for the Mountain View folks. And Mark also works with clients like the Wharton Business School, Harvard, and INSEAD. So without further ado, please welcome Mark Thornton. I'm good, thank you. Can you all uh, hear me okay? Okay, great, thank you. So a quick question, how many of you are brand new to meditation? Just raise your hand, wonderful. How many of you have uh, a very serious, rigorous, committed daily practice? Great. How many of you tried meditation before and found it just incredibly frustrating? Great, thank you. So my name's Mark Thornton. And really the purpose of today is to share with you as much information as I can. You know, I think when I was uh, 26 years old and I was, I'm from Australia originally, and I was in London, and I would describe myself as a hyped up, caffeine addicted stress junkie. I was so stressed that I was grinding my teeth at night and I had to wear a mouth guard. I also started to lose my hair. So I was 26 and thinking, I'm going to be bald and toothless by 30. <laughs> I'm glad you all laughed at that. <laughs> Nothing wrong with bald and toothless, but it really prompted a, a quite a deep inquiry. At the same time in my life, my father had just been diagnosed with cancer. And he linked very much the last three years of job stress with his, with his illness. So I wasn't going to be bald and toothless by 30. There was a chance I might not make it to 30. So I went on a particular search. And my search had to end up in India. But there I was passionate about trying to find uh, spiritual techniques that I could work with every single day. So as a COO, I, you know, I didn't have five minutes to spend with my girlfriend, let alone Lotus position, mantras, candles, ambient whale music, all that sort of stuff. So I was very fortunate I met a teacher and he taught me practices that I could do anywhere, anytime, and that were really as powerful as taking retreats and living in the Himalaya, Himal Himalayas and those sort of things. So I want to share as much of that with you as possible. Does that sound Interesting? No one wants to talk about tantric sex or something like that? <laughs> That's the advanced course, and it's very, very expensive. But fun, very fun too. 
So I come, I come kind of bearing some good news because, you know, the people like meditation has gone from weird and funky and we now have on your side some really incredible examples of institutions that are, are on board with this kind of revolution. So I teach at, um, you know, places like NCAD, I teach at Wharton Business School, I teach at Harvard Law School. Elite firms like McKinsey & Co are now introducing meditation as key practice for um, associate partners and partners. If you look at the top five cancer hospitals in the US, all of them mention meditation, not as a cure, but as a complementary alternative practice. It's the same with the top five heart hospitals. And in terms of science, and I won't go into this too much, but there, we have like a thousand plus studies on the scientific benefits of meditation. And I'm almost a bit embarrassed because I was asked by the US Army to, uh, to come up with a list of the benefits of meditation and the science behind it. And as I was compiling all the data, I felt like a fantasist. Like I was saying, well, not only can you reduce stress, it helps you with decision making, it reduces your mental activity, it helps you with focus, it helps you with all the stuff. Pages and pages of scientifically proven benefits. So there's a lot of stuff there. Typically, when I teach um, in companies, the results that staff and teams typically get is the capacity they can do more with less. They have an idea of like better resilience, a greater capacity to focus on what's really, really important to them. Also, there's a sense of like a master mindset that no matter what life throws at you, you have the capacity, the poise, the balance, the alignment to really cope with it in a masterful way. If you don't do this, it's more of the same. A sense of job fatigue, a sense of the in-tray is just too, too big and I can't, I can't source it. Complete energy depletion. So these are some of, some of the benefits. There's a fabulous study by Towers Parent on, um, it reviewed like 90,000 employees for different companies, different industries. And they found out that 20% of them were fully engaged, going above and beyond. 40% were enrolled, which means capable, but not, not really at peak performance. And 38% were disengaged and disenchanted. So that means if this was a football team, two would be really engaged, nine are not, and four are either on the sidelines or looking the other way. So I want to share, some, share with you some signs, and the signs are emerging and they are becoming more and more encouraging. The signs used to be confusing, <laughs> but we have some really interesting things. Check this out from Harvard Business, Business Review. Look at what is the number one top article that people were reading. A road map to a life that matters. And increasingly, peak performance leaders in teams are focusing on questions of not just delivery, not just execution, not just efficiency, but how do you create a life that matters for you and your team and your company and the planet? The other exciting news you have on your side is a strange ally, a strange institution of the US Army. The US Army has just introduced a program. It's been going now for a year and a half and it's called the Comprehensive Soldier Fitness. With more than a decade at war, the army is finding that soldiers are coming back and PTSD is a really, really big issue for them. So the army has now redefined what it means to be army strong. So to be army strong, they're defined as five key domains. Family, physical, social, emotional, and spiritual. So every member of the armed forces is going through a, a psychometric testing to identify each soldier's capacity and depth and strength in those five different domains. The remedial 25% are given additional training to boost up their, up their strengths and the top 5% become teachers. I saw this when I was teaching down at um, uh, Fort Hood, which is the largest army base in the US. I was teaching the leadership team. And the guy showed me this and I said, I've been trying to um, you know, share this message to Wall Street people for years and here like the US Army is coming out saying, soldiers need to have emotional intelligence. Soldiers need to have spiritual dimension as a key part of how they define their strength. So you probably know this, but one of the things I think when I talk with top teams is, 
your next step at Google, your next outbreak of, of top performance is really, it's not going to come from working harder. If you're at Google or JP Morgan, you are already working more hours than you can possibly handle. So working hard is not going to get it. And the New York Times wrote an article that said that the cost of job stress in terms of absenteeism, lost productivity, health costs, was more than a trillion dollars annually. The National Institution, Institute of Occupational Health and Safety said that the health costs alone, which means people who actually end up in hospital or seeing a medical practitioner, is $200 billion. That's roughly the economic cost of Hurricane Katrina every year. Another study said that 50% of Americans suffer from anxiety. And there was a great long-standing study from the state of Massachusetts, Massachusetts Department of Education, Health and Welfare, which said that America's number one killer, which is heart attack, happens most frequently on one day of the year, in one day of the week. Have a guess what day that is. Monday. Very good. And not only one particular day, but most frequently at one specific time on that day. Have a guess what time that is. 9 a.m., exactly. <laughs> so our work literally is killing us, which means we've mastered two speeds, fast and crashing. <laughs> The second myth that I tell every top leader is the myth that stress equals results. This is a big one. And <laughs> I was talking with a, uh, a managing director from a pharmaceutical company in London last week. And she argued this point with me. Turns out, I found out that she's actually on six months leave because of burnout. This myth is so prevalent that even if you've hit the wall and you're, you've burned out, that you're still addicted to this fantasy that stress creates results. So stress, the definition of stress, is a physical, chemical or emotional factor that causes bodily or mental tension and maybe a factor in disease causation. Awesome. You don't want this stuff to be what, what gets you your results. The opposite is true. The less stress you have as a peak performer, more happiness, more results, better health. And the key insight for this is if you speak to any peak performing athlete and you say, tell me about the link between you know, stress and results, they'll look at you strange and say, well, there is no correlation or they try and reduce the stress. I'll give you an example, I was talking to a friend of mine who is the coach for the Swedish Winter Olympic team, Runa Gustafsson, and we did some trainings together. And he said that he trained specifically cross-country skiers. What he noticed is when he reduced the signs and symptoms of stress, lower heart rate, lower respiratory rate, those sort of <coughs> things, his skiers could ski further and faster. And the idea is if you're already at peak performance, you've already got enough effort on top of that. The only people I know who need more stress is maybe the United States Postal Service. <laughs> they probably need, need more stress, but not folks at Google. And the mistake has always been that it's like looking at, at a car and people have just noticed that when the car is revving, and there's a lot of effort with the engine, there's a lot of exhaust coming out. And they've concluded that the exhaust is running the car. It's like if you're studying leadership and you go and you peer into the toilet of a leader <laughs> and you stick your finger in and you go, this is what's driving the leader. It's not. Stress is a byproduct, it's a waste product. You have complete permission now to reduce it. The mistake is thinking that this is driving this. So what gets results from peak performing athletes is not effort, but optimum effort. If you think about 
a tennis player at Wimbledon, the difference between a winning shot and a losing shot is infinitesimally small. So it's that absolute optimum effort. Too much effort, losing shot. So it's optimum effort we're going through. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. The other myth is that meditation is too hard. We're going to break that myth for you. So meditation is. So I also just want to share with you, before I get into the definition of meditation, is that I want to share a story about my, I think it was probably the worst day in my career at JP Morgan. I'd just been made COO. We'd, we had bought a bank called Robert Fleming in London. And pretty much it was a disaster. We were uh, a, exactly a year over schedule, a year behind schedule. We were 10 million pounds over budget. And the portfolio management trading team that we'd bought in, they hated us. <laughs> they were a conservative English boutique thing. And they thought, you know, the brash Americans are taking them over. So 40% of their portfolio managers, including the people who are driving the majority of revenue, wanted to leave. So that was my first day as COO. So what I did is I took action, I called meetings, I shouted when I needed to shout, I did stuff. But then I was, someone came to me and said, how can you be so calm? And I realized with a shock that I actually was that actually after years of meditation practice, what I'd learned is to take action from that place of center. Now, I wasn't asleep under my desk. I wasn't in a lotus position. I wasn't avoiding things. I didn't ask people to light candles. You know, I, I used to work on the training room floor, so it's a busy environment. So I share that because there's a real way in which these practices I want to share with you can become an integral part of your everyday. So what is meditation? So meditation is the effortless resting of your attention on your center, on your core, on your heart. And by heart, I don't mean it as in the sense of your physical heart, the muscle. I don't mean it in terms of some Eastern practices about the heart center. I mean it in terms of the phrase, the heart of the matter. To get to the heart of the matter is to get to the essence. So to explain that, I'll share with you a model of, and this, is a, this isn't specifically true, it's more like a, like a metaphor. But it was created two and a half thousand years ago by an Indian sage called Patanjali. And he shared this model of, of how you are made up as, as a person. So I'm not sure if you can see this up there. but. Okay. So this is you, slightly badly drawn you. But he said this is represents your physical body. And this is quite a dense quality, you can see it, you can touch it. And this is the outside of the body. And this is the inside. What also seems to be true is that if you close your eyes, what you're aware of is there is another layer of who you are, which is thoughts. And deeper than that now, is there's another layer of feeling. And there's other different layers. But as Patanjali said, as you drop deeper and deeper inside now, he said there was a place that you ended up that was, that he called the center. Now everyone in this room has had many, many experiences of the place called center, many, many times. You've experienced when you've gone for a walk in nature. You've experienced it when you've been relaxing, watching the sunset. Maybe it's inspiring art. Maybe you've read a beautiful book. It's looking to the eyes of the beloved. It's holding the child, that, that first gaze you have. Maybe it's like that total absorption in, in a task that you, that you love doing. So I just want to ask you, when you experience those, what are those qualities that you experience when you experience that center? 
and let's just call them out. Love. Love. Beautiful. Love. Peace. What else? Wonder. Gorgeous. Thank you. What else? Warmth. Thank you. Yes. What else? Presence. Beautiful. Thank you. What else? Tranquility. Tranquility. Thank you. So it is this body's passionate belief that what the world needs most now is leaders and people who can access these qualities wherever they are. And this, in my humble opinion, is business critical, mission critical. If you have access to these qualities that are already inside you, that nothing has to be manufactured or created, then how you lead will be radically, radically different. A leader who can connect with the quality and frequency of love, he will lead his or her team differently. You will ask different questions. You will have different visions about the future for your team, your company, your, your planet. So all of meditation is, is simply pathways to directly access this unchanging, deep part of who you really are. And these pathways are Buddhist, Zen, Hindu, Christian, different practices, breath, body, mantra, tantra, all these different paths are simply doorways into the direct essence of who you are. Does that make sense? <laughs> Great. So, I've completely lost where I am. So the first thing is, is, this sounds very nice and wonderful, but how do you build that into your everyday? So the first thing is to, what I call, um, OWFP, which is the Optimal Workflow Pattern. And there really are some uh, incredibly dazzling slides <laughs> which portray this very beautifully. <laughs> we just don't have access to them at the moment. <laughs> So I want to show you an example of, of, um, of really how this can happen. And the explicit invitation here is that everyone in this room has at least an hour every day that you can be practicing. Now, does that sound like a lot? Good. It is a lot. But in the Meditation in New York Minute, what we're doing is we are doing an hour a day but cumulatively, not consecutively. And what I mean by that is taking two seconds by the water cooler to breathe differently. As you're walking from meeting to meeting, take using those times to shift your breath. When you're standing in line at Starbucks, rather than overthinking, overprocessing, overanalyzing everything, just listening to your own mental code of spam, there's a way in which you can use those moments, which I call like dead time, to really take times to connect very deeply. And what I'm so excited, the reason why I'm so excited to share that is because for years I struggled with trying to do 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes at night time. And it was just, and I couldn't do it. So I kept beating myself up that you know, I wasn't deep enough, I didn't, wasn't committed enough, didn't have the willpower. Turned out, it's just I had the wrong set of practices. And my excitement is that when I could do these micro doses, but cumulatively up to an hour a day, that was as profound as sitting in a cave. It was as transformative. It was as easy to access these qualities. And the reason is that the mind, which is this code which keeps producing output, and some of it's genius, most of it's average, and a lot of it is quite destructive and limiting and, and real spam. Um, it needs to be that constant interruption throughout the day 
is what the mind needs. 20 minutes in the morning is great, you get peaceful, and then you have like 15 hours of sheer adrenaline rush, caffeine fueled anxiety, and 20 minutes at night. Whereas this way, we're really trying to break, break this up. So just a visual example of this is, you know, the old kind of approach to doing your job and leading was Hamburger Hill. We're going to be like the US Marines. We're going to take it at any cost. The new approach is finding a moment of center. She's a karate person. I don't know why, but <laughs> yeah. Taking a moment of calm. And from that, from that place of center, then you can take massive action. Then you have perspective to move a different range of movements. You also become Asian, strangely, <laughs> which is, I don't know why that is. Really, the production values here are not good. <laughs> so a moment of calm, lots of action. And the key thing is returning to that center, to that place of calm. So it's not an either or, but it's an and and both. I want to show you an example of a 70 pound pit bull versus a cat to show how you can have alignment and center in the midst of intense, intense activity. <laughs> <laughs> how cool is that with his little paws? But she's completely composed. So what this means, means for you is um, this OWFP means that you're continually interrupting and continually, continually making breaks. So there are practices that we can do when, when you're talking to someone, you can find a way to be more grounded. When you're presenting in a meeting, you can find a way to become more centered. Whilst walking to and from meetings, you can use that rather than just to mentally rehearse a whole lot of bad stuff. You can introduce new programs, new codes that are more supportive of this type of quality. I apologize to dog lovers. That's a the other really important thing is, with stress, you are only ever stressed by three things. That's it. Period. The first one is you don't have the skills. So you're a newly appointed manager and you haven't been trained on how to delegate, how to do feedback reviews. The second thing is you just don't have the resources. So you have the skill, but you don't have the money or time, for example, or people to help you deliver it. But most importantly is the mindset, the values, the beliefs to really deliver on that. That's the only three things. Like with sports, the reason why I love the last set so much is you can have people with the same experience, same age, background experience, same skill set, same resources, radically different results because different mindsets, values and beliefs. And this is one of the things that McKinsey's really teaching a lot on now is how leaders can mathematically identify and calibrate their beliefs and mindsets and work out what are the brakes and what are the accelerators to performance. Meditate an hour a day, every day. Cumulative, not consecutive. So to really help you, I wanted to, if, to share with you some meditation accelerators, like things that you can, if you wanted to um, take this invitation. There are three really interesting things to do. Number one is to find a teacher. Find a teacher, find a teacher, find a teacher. Everything I write about in my book and on my tapes and CDs, everything I've learned largely has come from a teacher. You, know, you can't learn judo through a, a book. You can't learn singing through a DVD. The most powerful transformative experiences to really accelerate is, is finding a teacher. The next big one is to create in offices circles of practice. I hope you're noticing the <laughs> circles, Google Plus. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the key here is, and, and people are doing this at the Stock Exchange in New York, and I've set up crews of people who do this, and it's just staff get together. Um, you can play a tape, you can play a DVD of, of a guided instruction or some, um, a teacher just sharing a practice with you. Very, very simple. The trick is that there's no th such thing as meditation. There are many, there are, you know, one of my teachers said there are as many meditations as there are recipes for food. They're just organized along different paths, Mexican food, Italian food. 
So rather than have a group that's on meditation, find the group that you love, that loves doing mindfulness. Set up a circle that loves doing mantra. Set up a circle that loves doing, mm, not tantra. <laughs> Don't do the tantra circle. Set up circles that are, are involved with breath stuff. Start up circles which are based on focus. Finding the right practice for you and getting your pod, your crew of people together is really important. Third one is to really experiment, because there are thousands. Find the one that most moves your heart. Find the one that most calls to you, that most has an impact for you. So the number one block to people enjoying practice is they are doing a mantra practice and it's the wrong tool for them. They're doing a mindfulness practice and they're bored out of their mind. It's just the wrong tool. So I'm trying to encourage you to think that there are literally thousands of practices that you can do. And I only write about 19 in, on, in my book. Um, but there are, there are lots. And that a teacher can really be able to connect with you and identify, this is the practice for you. Try this one. Fourth one is um, mastering emotions and triggers. Now this is a slightly... Um, this is a stereotypical view that some people have of men when it comes to emotions. They tend to think men have five emotions, largely which are or, <laughs> or, winning, sports, or Brooklyn Decker. <laughs> now clearly that's unfair and that's not true, but any idea how many emotions there are? in this experience of being human, have a guess how many emotions there are? 93. 93. <laughs> 10. 10. <laughs> Spoken like a true man. It's 10, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> There's 400. 400 human emotions and combinations of emotions. So in leadership teams, the power of meditation is you get to be very exquisitely aware of this inner domain here of, of feelings and become more sensitive to how that can serve you and hinder you. So moving from emotional intelligence to emotional mastery, and that means awareness, management, and particularly being aware of what triggers you. So if you're in a business meeting and you find that there are people, maybe people that are really triggering you, there's ways to deal with that. Anyone heard of this guy? <laughs> Since he did the rebel yell, he was just Howard Dean who just couldn't contain the emotions and it leaked out and really damaged him. This is Mike Tyson after he's fallen from like, you know, his peak. He was really, this is him, he was walking into some event and he was so triggered <laughs> by s something that a, a distant spectator shouted. He went on for about four minutes just shouting at this guy. You know, that's not emotional mastery. George McEnroe. So you may be wondering, well, if there's 400 emotions, and I'm a guy particularly, and I thought there were only five, how do I start to master that? And luckily, there is an app for that. <laughs> so the app is called Awareness. It lists 100 emotions and different moods. And I've worked with the creator of this to come up with different meditation practices that are linked to the different couplings of, of moods. It's very cool actually. At the end of each, each day or hour, or week or month, you get a pie chart and it gives you a cartography of your emotional universe, your, your emotional journey through the week or the month. This person was clearly enlightened. They've got peace, love, compassion. <laughs> Mine's not like that. So I wanted to, I wanted to finish really with a, with, um, a story and you know, thinking about things like focus and superior focus and in meditation we're fascinated with intention. We're fascinated with what, what drives focus. And uh, the experience has really been on, on meaning. The reason why we're doing here, why we're here. And I was at Fort Hood and I was teaching a, um, uh, some soldiers down there and I asked one of the soldiers privately, I said, what was it like being in, uh, you know, being in Afghanistan? And he told me this story. 
And he said that he was a staff sergeant in charge of a platoon. He was there in Afghanistan for two years. He said his base was at the bottom of a valley. And he said every day there were sniper shots, but they were very well concealed and they knew they were safe. However, every platoon leader had to take their team to man an outpost that was up a very, very steep hill that was 70, 80 degrees steep. It took four hours to walk from the base camp to the very, very top of the mountain. So he walked his team up there. And on the third day, one of his soldiers got too close to the sandbags, to the perimeter of the base. It was right at the top of this mountain. And a shot rang out. And the bullet went through the shoulders, soldier's wrist, through this side, out his stomach, and through his other wrist. And I mention that because that was how close the Taliban was for that, that amount of power to be reached. So I said to the soldier, I said, so, so, staff sergeant, so what did you do? So he said he, he dragged the guy away from the side, put him into the back where there was a medic. And he said the medic was very, very young. It was his second week there, very inexperienced. He was making basically a mess of it. The guy was in, in agony. And at that moment, shots rang out from the entirety of the perimeter. They were surrounded. First thing the Taliban did is they took out the communication towers. So there was suddenly no way they could communicate to the base that they needed reinforcements or for help. And even if they could, it was a four hour walk, hike to get to them. So I said to the staff, so, so what did you do? And he said, you know, he could hear the explosion, he could smell the, the, the gunpowder, the fire that was there. And he said, I told my men three things. And he said, there was no use sugarcoating it. You know, he could really see the fear in the men's eyes. And he said, I told them three things. First, this looks like it's it. Second, it's been a pleasure serving with you. Third, go out and be your, be your bravest. And they did. And for 45 minutes, they, they fought the Taliban. And um, there was a French fighter pilot that was flying low over the position and buzzed the position just to, for fun, took fire from the Taliban, turned around, dropped some bombs, and that was it. So the question I leave, leave you with is, this staff sergeant wasn't fighting for America, liberty, freedom, any of that stuff. It was his team. So how far will your people follow you? How far will your followers, your clients, how far will they follow you? What's their commitment? What's your why? Why are you in this building? What's the big, big reason you are here? And the more you are plugged into the deep reasons for being human, the deep reasons for being here, the more energy, the more clarity, the more poise. Thank you. Um, could you just also talk a little bit more about your own personal choices to the kind of corporate world and, and do what you're doing now? Sure, sure. Um, so it definitely wasn't the money. Um, to be honest, uh, I had an experience when I was, uh, I'm going to talk, I'm going to assume we're all friends here and I'm just talking to my friends rather than presenting. So I had an experience when I was chairing a meeting of the board of directors at JP Morgan. And in that meeting, using some of these practices, because I was chairing it, I could introduce someone, and I had some dead time. So I was doing some of these practices that you can do with your eyes open, fully aware of the room. 
And I was really shocked because I looked up and experienced that the room was filled with like a like I was aware of like the energy that made up the room. So in some teachers call it like seeing divine light, like being able to see energy everywhere. And I was completely shocked because there I was like a JP Morgan running a meeting and at the same time. So like externally I was like, you know, Thanks very much. Now I'm going to introduce Mr. Smith, who's going to talk to us about Luxembourg sea cabs, and it's very incredibly boring. Um, and internally, I was like, <laughs> I'd like to introduce the next speaker, who's um, even more boring than the first. And, um, <laughs> please don't make me do that visual gag again. <laughs> But um, that's the moment that I got it, that I got that no matter where you are, there is your center. No matter what you're doing, you carry the deepest part of who you are everywhere. And it's accessible at any time. And the myth that, you know, because I have a job or that I have a big to-do list, that that separates me from the divine, from source, from energy, it's just not true. So I felt, to answer your question, very deeply called that I felt I have to share this message. I really have to share this message with people. So, because for decades I'd struggled with it. You know, spirituality was the mountaintop. It was the robes, the beads, the teacher. It's not true. It's just not true. So. My wife jokes that I met my wife after I left JP Morgan. And she said, I've, I met you after you had money <laughs> and power and status. It's all true. <laughs> hey, Mark, thanks again for the talk. Thanks. That's great. So, a follow on question to that. Is it possible to integrate this type of practice and exist in this type of context? Oh, totally. So many of us focus on sort of delivering, right, in the there and then, in the future, or we're, we're reviewing performance in the past. But are we able to really be present and whole um, as per what's in the center there of that work in this type of, if in, of environment on an ongoing and systemic yeah. basis? Okay. So, um, I, mentioned, I, I left JP Morgan, but I'd been doing these practices for a long time. So um, it wasn't that I left and then I had these spiritual experiences. I had these spiritual experiences when I was out on the trading room floor. So the way, the way it works, I think, is that the more you do these practices, the more you access this, then eventually something interesting happens. These qualities start to it's like you're building a pathway in, like a pipeline, and eventually these qualities start to flow out. So it's that balance of being present in the moment, taking action, dreaming of the future, envisioning, being present. It's that whole thing, but everything comes from center. So it's learning that being centered, taking action, returning, and that returning again is very important. Very important. Thank you. Hi Mark, thanks for coming. I did read your book and uh, I thought one of the most uh, compelling parts was just in the beginning about living from your heart. I would love if you could just talk a little bit about that. What does that mean? How can I think about as someone who I may not have tapped into that, how can I start living from my heart? Yeah, quite right. So um, living from the heart was a, a way to try and describe living from the sort of deepest essence of who you are. and there's a really interesting practice that, that I wanted to share and, and do you have that experience you're driving, you can drive a car and you can talk on a cell phone, yeah? You can sit on your laptop, talk on the phone, tweet, glance on, I mean, you can do a lot of stuff, right? So we all have the skills to have foreground awareness and background awareness. So one of the powerful ways to find the quality of your heart is to, you know, rest your attention effortlessly in the center of your chest. And you can do that whilst you talk, you can do that whilst you're running meetings, you can do that whilst you're walking, in the same way that you can talk to your mum on the phone <laughs> whilst reading the newspaper. So that is a way, and you know, where energy, attention goes where energy, attention flows where en energy flows where attention goes. What you notice you magnify and what you worship you become. So you can move about on the, 
on this through your daily life whilst keeping some of your attention anchored in the center of your heart. It's like the analogy is like if I'm standing on the circumference there and I'm facing outwards and the center is behind me, it's finding a way in which I can reach out, connect to the center and still be present. But always returning to that. And there's times when in work I need to drop this and be completely, that's really important too, to know when to let go and to do your work. Yeah, so it's just a reaching back, connecting. And sometimes you, know, you have to look directly at the center and sometimes eventually you can actually stand, stand in the center of your essence and, and talk from there. And then you pop out again and it's a kind of solid quixotic dance, but ultimately there's, there's, it makes a difference. I was, when I saw the title of this talk, I thought I was going to get uh, some techniques, but uh, this was more like a description of uh, strategy rather than technique. So, can you do anything in, in such short bursts of time, uh, or how do you know that you are making progress when you do that? Sure, great question, thank you. So, the idea is to Pick a practice, do it as frequently as you can. You need to give yourself some time as to how impactful it is. There are some techniques you try and it's instantly like a sweet kind of nectar. Like there's a sense of, oh, this is like returning home again. There's others which are creating actually more mental confusion and more internal dialogue and more sense of frustration. That's just the wrong technique. So I'm, I'm not an advocate of pick a practice, try it for three months, go through turmoil. Because my, my intuitive sense is that you know, your heart knows what it needs. And it can recognize a practice that is most rich for it. And anything else is too, too painful. So you have to try it, see how it goes. Um, don't bash your head against the wall. It could just mean just the wrong practice. Is that helpful? Thank you. Um, I'm curious if, not from your own experience, but from experience of your clients, what they find the most challenging thing when they're making that transition from life before and then life moving towards the ability to be able to be in that moment for those minutes a day, separately, cumulative minutes a day. Sure. What, would you, what would you most like to know about that journey? Like what would I like to know? Yeah. Um, I guess what what people typically find the most challenging? Is it the right practice or, or what, what have you seen? I would say the biggest challenge is, the biggest challenge is to experience the kindness of what it is to be human. Because as soon as you turn within, you are faced with a whole lot of stuff that many people are not familiar with, de dealing with. I can guarantee you in meditation you'll become more aware of parts of you that are dark, parts of you that are shadow, parts of you that are uncomfortable, as well as parts that are, are light and glorious. And the biggest temptation is to close down and move away from things that are, that are, are actually them, but are, are held in, in shadow. And people have structured their lives not wanting to look at that stuff, you know. It's like, no, I'm looking there. There's a lot of stuff that, and that's where the freedom is when you can start to realize that we're human and we have light and we have dark. And that moment to moment practice of kindness with, with yourself for, for who you are and, and for your experience. Because a lot of people think meditation is, I'm going to run to the light and wear white clothes and be holy. And, um, and you know, I was a bliss junkie for many years, I think. But so. Mark, so thank you for coming and delivering Pleasure. this message. So having grown up in India as a teenager, I was lucky to have stumbled across both yoga and meditation, and I agree. These are the anchoring uh, principles and pillars in my life. But in talking to Googlers, a, a dichotomy that comes up in most people's mind, and I want to bring it up to you and see what your answer is. On the one hand, here's a group of high achievers who feel the relentless pressure on a daily basis, not enough time 
in a day to answer all the emails, get to all the meetings, and, uh, and chase all of the goals. The skills and resources are available, but people feel there's not enough time. There's a stress yeah. associated with that. On the other hand, here's somebody, former CEO of JP Morgan, coming and saying, yeah, find a teacher, meditate, find your place of heart, and your life will be perfect. And there is a, there is a big gap there that often people find, how do I leap across and trust them? And how would you propose that people close that gap in their minds? Sure. Thank you, Gopi. So I would say that for me, like context is important. So I don't believe the setup of life that we don't have time. I don't, I don't believe it. There's always ways to be skillful with it. The invitation for practicing an hour a day cumulatively whilst not giving up any part of your agenda at all, that's a, that's a huge, huge inspiration. You know, I can simply cut down on my dead time, my over-processing, and add it, add it to a way in which I'm creating more aliveness in myself. So trainings are really good. Finding teachers, if people have interest in, in finding teachers, there are some um, great resources. The top three websites in the US, which are like the magnets for all the spiritual teachers in the US. You can browse through that stuff and just work out what, where, if there's a pool for you. There's lots and lots of resources out there, and I'm happy to share that with Rach and with anyone and share those things. One minute. Is that partly helpful, Gopi? I think that the key thing for me has been that um, has been that experience that there are ways where it weaves artfully into the, your experience of life. So it, be, it can become part of the fabric of your everyday experience. And that's what's really rich for me. Thank you, Mark. Thanks right. for coming. Yeah, thank you.